Next up we have Daniel Wolpert, uh, currently still at Cambridge, but in progress of moving. And let's see what, how that high level plan lays out uh, to Columbia. Um, and uh, Daniel will talk about uh, probabilistic models of sensory motor control. Go. You may go. Okay, thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm going to try and cover in the next half an hour some of the questions we're interested in and how the brain controls movements, and some of those are difficult. But I want to start first with the simplest question we can ever really ask. And one, because you're all mostly neuroscientists in this room, should have asked yourselves right at the beginning of um, elementary school, if not when you started your graduate school. And that is, why do we and other animals have brains at all? There are many species on our planet who don't have brains. So if we evolved this brain, what was the purpose of it? Because that would help us maybe try to understand what it's trying to achieve. And if you think about this question for any length of time, it's blindingly obvious why we have a brain. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movement. Now, if you think about it, movement is the only way you have of affecting the world around us. Now, that's not quite true. There's one other way you can affect the world, and that's through sweating. But if you take sweating out of the picture, everything else goes through the contractions of muscle. So speech, gestures, writing, sign language all require you to contract your muscles to affect the world around you. So it's important to remember that sensory memory and cognitive processes are all important, but they're actually only important to drive or suppress future movements. There can be no evolutionary advantage to laying down memories of childhood or perceiving the color of a rose if it's not going to affect the way you move later in life. So I'm a movement chauvinist. I believe movement is the most important thing the brain does, and all these other things just play into that movement. So to understand the brain, eventually we're going to have to understand behavior and movement. So today what I want to do is cover sort of uh, the motor hierarchy, um, starting from sort of the low levels. This is a very, not very good um, picture. Um, starting from sensory motor noise at the Bayesian and optimal control. I then move up, just briefly tell you a little bit about motor learning in terms of temporal context. And finally, how we link decision making and control together in terms of active sensing. So control of movement sounds very easy. You send a command down, it causes your muscles to contract, the configuration of the arm will change, and you get sensory feedback from the skin, from muscles, from vision, and so on. But one problem is these signals are not the beautiful signals we'd like them to be. Sensory feedback is extremely noisy. If you put your hand under a table and try to localize it with the other hand above the table, you can be off by many centimeters. Similarly, most commands are very noisy. Try to aim for the same point in a dartboard over and over again, you get a huge spread. And tasks we do are both ambiguous and variable. This teapot can be full, it can be empty, it changes with time. So we work in this sensory motor and task soup of noise. Now it turns out this noise is so great, this uncertainty, that our society is willing to reward those of us who can reduce the bad consequences of this. So if you're lucky enough to be able to knock a small white ball into a hole hundreds of yards away with a long metal stick, our society was willing to reward you with hundreds of millions of dollars. But I want to convince you also that the brain goes to a lot of effort to reduce the bad consequences of these sorts of uncertainty. And so the framework we work in for the last 10 or 15 years is that of Bayesian decision theory. Um, so the idea, and as Leslie mentioned, is we want to generate beliefs about the world, and the belief can be anything. You know, are my arms in this configuration or this configuration? You know, will there be a hot food for lunch? You know, am I looking at a friend or a foe? And there are only two sources you can generate beliefs from. There's data, which is in terms of the brain as sensory input, and there's prior knowledge, memory, or genetically encoded information. So when you're doing a motor task, such as playing tennis, and the ball flies over the net, and you want to estimate where it's going to bounce, you can use data, that sensory input, vision, audition, integrate that over time. And it may tell you the ball's most likely to bounce here, but this red cloud shows you your uncertainty. Now, the reason there's a cloud there is you should know that your sensors are not perfect. So although it's most likely here, there's a smaller chance here and less here. That information is available on the current shot. But there's also information available not on the current shot, but by experiencing and learning about the statistics of the game of tennis. That maybe in this particular point in the game, you know that your opponent's going to try and distribute it in this green area, the prior. And therefore, if you're a good Bayesian, you'd multiply the numbers in the red by the numbers in the green, renormalize to get the posterior. And over 10 years ago, we showed that if you apply this sort of prior to a motor task, for example, this red prior where the ball was, and then people did thousands of trials, you could show that they sort of internalize the prior and, and you could explain the behavior based on that. And so we think that the sensory motor system does a reasonable job, not perfect, at representing distributions of tasks. 
it knows something about its own sensory uncertainty and combine those in a Bayesian way. And so at about the same time, people suggested that you know, object perception could be explained in a Bayesian way. We suggested that you know, Bayesian decision theory was a good way to think about sensory motor control. And others, including Josh Tenenbaum in this room, suggested you could use it to explain inductive learning and reasoning. So is there anything that couldn't explain, I hear you ask? Well, what about attention? Well, don't worry, there are good Bayesian theories of attention. And even diseases such as schizophrenia now have lovely Bayesian explanations to schizophrenia. Even the humble mirror neuron now has a Bayesian perspective. So is it just you know, we humans for which this Bay seems such a good model? Well, it turns out that's not the case because owl's behavior and neural representations are also predicted by Bayesian inference. So maybe it's any whole organisms which show this wonderful Bayesian property. Well, that's also not the case because even the way that axons find their target is determined by Bayesian processing. Now, it's not terribly surprising that Bayes is rife throughout because there's something called the Dutch book theorem, which says if you're not Bayesian, you can be taken advantage of. So Bayes is just a sort of mathematics to say optimal. But there's a problem for those who don't like the Bayesian approach. They will say, well, your prior is a bunch of free parameters. You could con always construct an arbitrarily complex prior to explain any behavior you want. And that's true. And more than that, the advantage of having a prior is really that you have one which generalizes across tasks. If every task has its own prior, we're just fitting data arbitrarily. And surprisingly, there have been very few studies where people have tried to look at the prior across task, uh, tasks. And so we've developed a technique, and this is a collaboration between a group of machine learners and neuroscientists. We couldn't have done it without the machine learners, to develop um, something we call cognitive tomography, rather fancily. And the reason we call it that is like real tomography. We're going to take low-dimensional measurements, binary or ternary measurements, and from many of those, try to reconstruct a high-dimensional representation. That's the prior. And so we're actually going to use faces. I know it's not motor control, but it's easier to demonstrate. So here, for example, are a bunch of faces um, from the Basel data set. It's um, the structure of faces, so the plus or minus four um, standard deviations in the first two principal components shown here. And these are faces. We're going to give people a task to do, maybe present two faces, and we're going to get binary responses. And what we want to do is from what we show subjects and the task and the responses, we want to basically recreate the subjective distribution. So it may well be that all of you have a different prior over the structure of faces. You'll have different experiences, and maybe you have a prior like this over faces in this particular space. We have a hypothesis of how the stimulus theta responses. We also model noises and biases in decision making. And then we basically use advanced machine learning techniques to infer the subjective distribution, factoring out things we don't care about, such as noises and biases and perception and decision making. And if you want to know the details for how we do that, there are 25 pages of supplementary material in this paper where we go through it in detail and validate it on artificial data sets and show it's reasonably robust um, to the, even to the stimuli we show. So what we can do is we can give people a very simple task, two faces, and we just say to them, which one's more familiar? So we're asking them to compare these faces to some internal representation of faces. And if we do that for many thousand trials, we can then extract the prior, which best explains that particular subject's data. And as you'll notice, it's highly structured. It's not just a simple Gaussian in this space. If we take another subject and do exactly the same task on them, we get a different prior distribution. And you'll know that it it's very different across subjects. So we get idiosyncratic priors for this familiarity task. But we can take the same subjects and give them a different task, an odd one out task. Now, the odd one out task is different. You're asked to say, which of these three is, do you think is the odd one out? Uh, we tell them a story. They come from two different towns. Which one comes from the one town and which two come from the other town? And the idea here is you're having to compare the faces to each other. But again, you can imagine that the prior plays into this because effectively the way we model this is two faces are generated from the prior and then one gets corrupted. And therefore, you can compare three different possibilities to determine which one is the odd one out. And we fit this to our subjects. What you see is we get priors which are very similar across tasks. Now, the similarity is nice, and just here are four subjects. These are four of our best subjects. Now, what makes them the best subjects? They're the best because we repeat some of the stimuli at multiple times during presentations, and we ask how often do our subjects answer the same way for the identical stimuli. And so we can measure consistency in our subjects, and the less consistent they are, the harder it is to fit uh, using our model. But the proof of the pudding really is, can we fit the prior to one data set and predict behavior in the other? And the answer is we can do that reasonably well. 
This shows the fraction correct when we predict within task. We take half the data familiarity, split it, fit it, and try to predict the other half, and we do well above chance. But this is where we take data from the odd one out prior and use it to predict familiarity, and this is vice versa. And you may say, well, you're not doing terribly well, but we can do the cons use our consistency method to say how well could we ever do, given the consistencies our subject shows when we repeat the stimuli, and that's shown by these dashed lines. So we're very close to the upper bound of how well we could ever do predicting. So it suggests that prior to the face is a highly structured, subject-specific, and predictable behavior. So we think there's really strong evidence that we're not overfitting priors, that the priors really do have some meaning, and they generalize across tasks. We're very keen, in fact, to work more with machine learning to develop these techniques. One of the problems with this is even doing it in two-dimensional is very data-hungry. And what we'd like to do is do active learning in this, so we could actually go to higher dimensions, but each step we're always fitting the model so we can present the optimal stimuli to the subject. But at the moment, we just don't have the speed to do that. So beliefs are absolutely no use without actions. And so one thing which has interested us for a long time is the fact that there's a lot of noise in the motor system. So if you ask people to generate forces with different parts of their body, their thumb, their finger, their wrist, their elbow, against a force transducer, so just a constant force and just maintain it, what you find is people are very variable. Here's the mean force produced against the standard deviation force. And you can see for different muscle groups, we have a reasonable linear relationship between standard deviation and mean on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. So this is signal-dependent noise, as we call it that the noise scales with the signal. And interestingly, although we should have realized this, the smaller the muscle group, the bigger the coefficient of variance. So if you want to generate a really precise force, use your biggest muscle group, because you can average over more fibers than small muscle groups, which have less fibers or less motor units. And this is interesting to us because it might help solve a problem of why we move in the particular stereotypical ways that we do. So when I do any task, there are infinitely many different ways I could achieve that task. So reaching from this point in space or this point to catch a ball, I could move along this path or this path or infinitely many other paths. If I choose a particular path, it specifies my desired command, let's say, for one particular muscle. This is just a cartoon. And because of noise, I'm going to get big noise for big commands, small noise for small commands. If I was to restart the movement and do it many times, the desired command might be the same. The actual command's going to be different each time due to noise, and so I'll get a distribution of possible outcomes, shown like this. If I move a different way, I'll have a different desired command, different noise out of different points, playing through a nonlinear system. All bets are off as to what the distribution will be. The only thing we can be 100% sure about is the distribution's going to be different. And so if I move this way, maybe my variability looks like this. So the idea is a sequence of commands and genders of probably distribution of possible outcomes. And so if I said to you, would you rather move this way or this way? I hope you'd all choose the one on the right, because the variability is best. And so the idea is that maybe you can specify for each movement what you care about in terms of the probability distribution of the outcome, in terms of position, forces, durations, whatever. I think any task can be put in the statistical domain. And then you can turn this arrow around and say, what's the optimal sequence of commands? to minimize the bad consequence of this noise, which we think is fixed in the system. And if we apply that to simple things, for example, saccadic eye movements or arm movements, you can do a reasonably good job of predicting the velocity profiles of saccadic eye movements shown here, or the paths and velocity profiles of arm movements. So we think it's a biologically plausible underpinning for goal-directed movement that effectively noise corrupts your ability to do movements, but you can control the statistics by using your many degrees of freedom to choose a particular way to move. Ooh, don't know why that's there. One slide too many. OK, so this is where we were a number of years ago. A task specified a cost. I want to be as least variable, most accurate. A planner would then say, OK, here's the sequence of commands or the desired trajectory that you want to have. And a controller's job was just to keep you on that desired trajectory. And noise might push you off. But you'd have a state estimator, which might use a predictor as well as sensory feedback to optimally estimate the state. You compare that with the tra desired trajectory and try to keep yourself on that trajectory. But this idea is very much vanished from the human motor control field because it's a really bad idea for a number of reasons. I mean, one reason it vanished is because physiologists spent a long time trying to find the neural correlates of this desired trajectory, sort of straight lines with bell-shaped velocity profiles, and weren't able to. But more than that, if you're making a movement to a target and you get perturbed off your desired trajectory, 
The idea is you want to get back onto that path. But there are many situations, for example, such as reaching for that door in the corner, where you have a nice long bar you can aim for. Now, if you get perturbed off, it doesn't really matter. You can just reach to somewhere else on that bar. So a key idea is minimum intervention principle. Only intervene in an ongoing task if it's going to affect task performance. If you intervene in an ongoing task when it didn't matter, you add in more noise and more effort into the task. And more than that, if you look at the variability of movements, you're not controlling the variability as though you're going along a desired path. This is from Todorov's work. If you reach around an obstacle to hit a uh, precise point here, and you look at the variability across repeated movements, you see it starts at zero, it increases in the middle, and only decreases where it matters. If you ask people to minimize the variability at the midpoint, then they'll have greater variability at the end. So effectively, you let things explode where they don't matter. And so, more recently, the idea of the desired trajectory has gone and has been replaced with something else, an optimal feedback controller. So the idea, again, is still there's a task um, with a cost, but what the planner does is it specifies how you're going to use your current estimate of state to drive the commands through a feedback controller, which varies with time. And the idea is this is set up in a way so as to be optimal under assumptions of the sort of perturbations and noise you'll experience. And this work is primarily due to Emmo Todorov at the University of Seattle in Washington, and it ties together planning, online control, coordination, effort, and noise. And the basic idea is there are two predominant costs. I've already talked about terms to do with accuracy. But there are also terms to do with effort. You want to be lazy. So when it comes to walking, I could choose to really be precise and never fall, but I'll use a lot of energy. So instead, we think when it comes to walking and cycling, you care about energy, and you don't mind tripping occasionally. When it comes to feeding yourself with a knife and a fork, we think energy is not important at all. What's much more important is to get the fork into your mouth rather than into your cheek. So for different tasks, there are different trade-offs of energy and accuracy. And then, by magic, you can develop a time-varying feedback control law given the plant or dynamics. And there's a lot of maths which go between this and this. Um, for linear systems, it's pretty, pretty much solved. For non-linear, there's some good approximations. So this gives you an example of the sort of quantitative predictions you can make from this model. This just shows you what the feedback gain should be for a very simple point-to-point -point movement. So it says that the positional gain, for example, should increase and decrease. The velocity gain should do something complex. And the gain on the activation muscle does something else complex. And so we're trying to test out some of these gains in the lab and just give you a, just a little bit of example. This is the gains we measure when we visually perturb the movement during it in response. So it's a positional gain, showing that for short movements, it starts low, increases, and then decreases. For longer movement, it peaks in the middle. So it's not dependent on the position of the arm, but much more where you are in the movement, at least in qualitative agreement to what we see for this positional gain here. So what I really said at the moment is at the bottom level, there's noise in the system. You want to generate some motor command as a function of position and velocity. That's your feedback control shown by this surface. Because of noise, you can't be sure where you are in the space, so you do your Bayesian estimation. And even if you knew where you are, there's vertical noise with more noise for big commands and less for small commands. But that's just at one task. There are many varieties of tasks, and tasks vary both in parameters. So when you handle cans, they can vary in their size and shapes. And if you're a good Bayesian, you parametrically vary and learn the distribution of cans. But there are also different structures in the world, and that not everything's a can. Some things are power tools, and they may require very different control processes. So we've been doing a lot of work on trying to separate out structure from parameter learning. I don't have time to tell you about that today. But what I want to tell you about instead is what we think is really important in learning, and that's the temporal context. So interference in motor learning is really strong in the lab. So if we give someone the following task, we ask them to make a reaching movement to a target, but we ask them to hold a robot while they do that, and the robot generates a nasty force field on their hand. So the force is proportional to the speed of the movement, but always acts at right angles, so they're going to get perturbed. But we tell them if this light is on, the force is going to be to the right on that trial, and if this light is on, the force is going to be to the left. And then we interleave these fields. It's a clockwise field, counterclockwise. Each trial, they get one of these fields randomly, and the cue to which one they're going to get is this. And the way we measure learning in this task is occasionally we put the cue on, but we use the robot to constrain them to a channel. We put a spring in, a horizontal spring, and then we can measure the force they generate into this channel. They think they're performing perfectly into the channel as a measure of their predictive force they think they're going to get. 
and then we can quantify that between zero and 100% of what's perfect. And this shows you what happens if you do this experiment. You run them for an hour and a half, this is adaptation, no adaptation to 100, the gray is when the false put on, and they learn nothing at all, effectively. This is no significant learning. You can't learn two separate motor memories over the same physical part of space based on some cognitive or visual cue. So the question is, what does allow you to learn multiple memories over the same point in space? And so rather than just have that as a visual cue, we use it as an action cue. They now start from this point and move in with no force field and then go through the force field. And if they start on the left, they're going to get a rightward force field. If they start on the right, they're going to go leftward. I, I separate these space, they're really overlapping in space. And we, we, al we also counterbalance the direction of the force field with the direction of lead in. But we're going to make different groups wait for a different amount of time at this point. So if they have to wait a second at that point, they can't learn anything at all. If they only have to work half a second, we see substantial learning. 150 milliseconds even more. And if they don't have to wait at all, we get really remarkable learning. Now, for those of you who don't work with opposing force fields, learning opposing force fields is really challenging in the lab. So the fact that what you've done in the last 500 milliseconds seems to allow you to separate out your motor memories. If your arm has done something different, then effectively you have separate motor memories. If, unfortunately, you wait here for a second or half a second, there's really no advantage. So it occurred to us if the past is important to separate out motor skills, what about the future? Could the future be important? So here we have a control group. Now, they, again, there's a target here, but it's, they can ignore the target. They're just told to move through the force field, and the force field is determined by which of these targets is on on each trial. And if we do that, again, we get no learning at all. But in another group, they're told, I want you to move through the force field and then follow on that movement to another target. And the direction of that follow-through movement is predictive of the field they're going to get. And in this situation, we see substantial learning. So following through differently allows you to separate motor memory something that happens before the follow-through. And that's interesting to us because in sports, people are told to follow through. Yet we know once you let go of a ball or made contact with the ball, it can have no effect on the ball. So why should follow through be important? So we hypothesize that perhaps if you're learning something and you do a consistent follow through, always the same, you're activating one motor memory. So everything gets put into one memory. If on the other hand, you do a skill and you do a different follow through each time, you may be spreading your learning over multiple memories. So we can test this. We have one group. And it's now a very simple task, just learning a single field. They either do a consistent follow-through, or in every trial, we tell them to do a different follow-through. We queue one of these targets. And what we find is the group who do the consistent follow-through, the red, learn significantly faster than the group who learn the blue. And when we model this, what seems to be happening in this is you're decaying your memory in between each trial, as though you're moving from one memory to another. So we think this is a potential, not the only reason you follow through. It allows you to consolidate a single memory. So what is it about following through? What is it about the future which allows you to separate these memories? So this is two more groups of subjects just replicating our original finding, no follow through and follow through. Is it the execution of the follow through that matters? Well, we can answer that by doing the following. Subjects start off in one of the fields, but they don't see the follow through target until halfway through the movement where we turn it on and they get to follow through. So they could learn to associate this follow through sort of retrospectively with the field, and the way we test that is on some trials, we turn the target on from the beginning, but they're in a channel, so we can measure their predictive force, but there's nothing to learn because there's a channel on. And what we see in this group is there's no learning at all. So simply executing the follow-through has no benefit at all. What about planning the follow-through but never executing it? We have a group who, when the, when the target is on, they're told to follow through. They start moving through the force field, but halfway through the movement, we turn the follow-through target off, and they have to stop here. So whenever the force field is on, they never get to follow through. But we encourage them to plan the following through by having many of these trials where they start the movement, there's no force field, but they get to follow through. So we're encouraging them to follow through, but they can't learn on the follow through. They can only learn on the ones they plan, but they only execute. And in this situation, we see just as good learning as a real follow through. So it seems to be what's important here is that you plan, not execute the follow through. So how do we explain this data? Well, our working hypothesis at the moment is it's the neural rather than the physical states which are linked to motor memories. What's key to separate memories is the brain's in a different state, not the arm is in a different state. Um, 
and that seems to be important. And so we actually rely on some of the work of Churchill and Chenoy, where they look at motor cortex, and they look at what happens to multiple neurons when you plan and execute a movement. And if you take a particular projection down, what planning is, is moving to some point in neural space where you hold, and the execution is sort of the ev evolution of a dynamical system, which basically takes you through the trajectory. And so the idea is that when you have to do a lead into this movement, the neural state at the second point is different, even though it's the same physical state, because it's all one movement. So when you plan the blue movement, you come to here. For the red movement, you're out here. For the second point, you're in different neural states. If, on the other hand, you get to wait here for one second, effectively the first movement is complete and decayed back, and then for the second movement, which is the same, you're in the same neural state. So separating is important. Similarly, for the follow-through experiment, effectively, if you plan this as one movement, again, you'll be in different neural states for the initial portion, even though the physical states are the same, allowing you to separate motor memories. So we're beginning to get a feel for what the rules are which allow you to learn multiple things or coalesce things, what things can reduce interference um, in, in sensory motor control. So finally, um, there's something above all this, which I've ignored for many years, and that's decisions. Most of the time, what we do is we tell people what to reach for, what to do. But clearly, something that's above the motor system and decides what it is you might want to do. And so I want to tell you just about one experiment we've done recently, which looks at active sensing. And the idea is that many tasks require you to extract information quickly, which might be very behaviorally relevant. So if you look at these bushes here, and there's different animals behind each one, and they've got fur, so you can try to identify the fur, but it's a hard task. You'd have to make eye movements between these little patches and try to integrate that. But you might want to do that in a very efficient way because it makes a big difference whether you can identify whether it's a cheetah or a zebra. And so active learning basically says, because your sensory apparatus is attached to your body, you may want to move your body not to achieve a motor task, but to achieve a perceptual or cognitive task in an efficient manner. And so, if you're a good Bayesian, you would generate a Bayesian active sensor, which would say, given the evidence from a couple of fixations here and here, I can generate with Bayes' rule my percept based on the evidence I've got, my prior overfurs, and I get my posterior, the probability of a cheetah given the evidence or a zebra given the evidence. And then what I'd want to say is, where should I next look to maximally differentiate between these two? And you hopefully find the optimal location, and you may see there's a nice stripe running through here, and you're safe, it's a zebra. So we're not the first people to look at active sensing. It's really been studied a lot, and even in vision it's been studied. But it's primarily studied where there's a latent thing you're trying to find, like some target and noise, and people have focused more on the geometry. So we really want to look at something a bit more abstract. Can we, on a fixation-by-fixation fixation basis, estimate how informative is the choice you made and how close to optimal you are. And to do that, we generate artificial furs. Here are artificial furs. There's patchy furs and stripy furs. And these are generated by Gaussian processes. And the nice thing about Gaussian processes is we control the statistics of these, but no pixel is ever informative. Okay? You have to integrate across pixels to know. Now, if I show you these, it's a trivial task. You, know, you would never fail which one's patchy or stripy. So to ask how good you are at active sensing with your fovea, we start with a blank screen. Wherever you fixate, we reveal a very small Gaussian aperture. And then your job is move your eyes around as you want, and as you do, we reveal Gaussian apertures, and at some point in time, we're going to say stop, and you get no more revealings, and you have to say whether it's patchy or stripy. And we don't let them know how many revealings they're going to get because we want them to be greedy because it makes the mathematical modeling easier. So on each step, we're assuming they're trying to be as greedy as possible. Any guesses as to patchy or stripy? Not easy. That's actually uh, patchy. Okay, so it's a hard, hard task. Okay, but our subjects do it. Okay, here's, I haven't got time to derive the model. Here's the model. It's a Bayesian model, which basically says, given the circades I've got up to now, the data, my eye locations, fixations, and the pixels revealed, how informative is each possible location in my two-dimensional visual field? And it's made up of two components here. And let me give you the intuition of what those two components tell you. This one says I want to be overall uncertain. Wherever I'm going to go next, I want to not know the pixel value. Okay? There's no point going somewhere I've been before, in inhibition of return, go somewhere. If I just did that, I would go sort of far away in space all the time, not very useful. So the second part says I want to go somewhere where each hypothesis is certain. I want to go somewhere I don't know the pixel value, but patchy and stripy make different predictions. 
Okay? So it's a trade-off between those two things, which is the optimal thing to do. And the idea is we can unravel this in time. Here's the actual image, which is hidden. After the first revealing, um, which was there, this is the map of the number of bits you would get by going to different points in the scene. The Xs show the optimal locations, and the O shows where the subject went. And if you look after the second decade, you can see that here's the optimal location. The subject went there, because you could say they're very far away from optimal. But we don't rate optimal in that sense. We rate optimal in how well they've done in terms of the bits they could have get. And so these numbers here, 90, 91, 77, tells you the percentile score of where they chose. So as we go along here, you can see they do very well. And to cut a long story short, I've only got one more slide after this. What we can show is effectively people are close to optimal. This is how well they improve when they freely scan. You can look at their eye movement patterns, which match very nicely with the picture of the Bayesian. But what we can show is if we actually show them the optimal locations, they do much better. And what we can show is if we had sensory, motor, and inaccurate learning, subjects about 70% efficient. I want to finish with this slide just to tell you why I think the computational approach is so important in neuroscience. When I was a medical student back in 1982, this book, Principles of Neural Science, had just come out. At that time, it had 750 pages. Now, I can tell you that's a lot of pages that I had to pretend to read. But in the intervening years, we've done very well generating new editions and new principles. And there's another book coming out next year, which I think is going to be somewhere up here. So if I want to ask how many pages my grandchildren have to read if they went to university and read neuroscience, well, look, R squared 0.96, about 3,000 pages of principles. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I would say it's a really bad thing. This is not a book of principles. This is a book of all the experimental data, which is great, which can't be encapsulated in principles. And the problem is, most of the world is made of experimentalists. If you go to Society for Neuroscience, 30,000 people, 99.9% .9 are doing lovely experiments. I do experiments, they're great. Theoreticians need to come in from machine learning, AI, and from the younger generation to apply pressure to this curve to bring it down to where it deserves to be a book of principles and not just all the facts which can't be summarized, not only for neuroscience, but for your grandchildren. Okay, <laughs> I, study, I study motor control because I'm interested in the brain. It has some payoffs sometimes. Many diseases are affected in the motor system. Rehabilitation can learn from understanding basic mechanisms, and hopefully one day we can help roboticists. I want to finish by reminding you when you say very simple creatures doing motor control tasks, that's your complexity and their brain is really dramatic. Thank you very much. Thank you, fabulous. Thank you. Okay, we have some time. I can't see anything. There's a hand up over here. Um, oh, there's a hand up. Well, let no. Let's get students first. Students Terry, first. you're not first. You yeah. don't get to go first this time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great talk. So. I guess you and the previous talk have been talking about this kind of probabilistic state-state representation. Um, and I think it's like a really uh, principled framework to represent uncertainty in which neuroscientists <coughs> have been benefited a lot as a normative model. So my question is, as, as far as I understood, uh, it's a really hard engineering problem if you want to generalize this to like very high dimensional problem. So, uh, and also like it's kind of deep end-to-end -end reinforcement learning. They're not like deal dealing with uncertainty in an explicit way. So I just want to hear like your ideas about like how neuro how neural system could like deal with this kind of problem and yeah. what's the implication. Yeah, so so yeah, so what I didn't say is obviously these are intractable in, you know, doing the full Bayesian thing is intractable in reality. Okay. So the interesting questions which we're trying to do is what approximations does the brain use to get close to the optimal solutions? Because it can't actually get the optimal solutions in any real world problems. And so we've been asking things like what are the limits and what you can learn with Bayesian. Uh, at the moment in the the other, the other side of the comment I haven't talked about is how does the brain really compute with neurons to do Bayes? At the moment, there are a bunch of different theories from sampling theory to pr probabilistic population codes, which are fighting it out. And I think that will also help us to understand what approximations and what the limits are. And, and I have to say, you know, although at the motor system we're very keen on Bayes, as you get higher and higher in, into more and more cognitive, it comes harder to explain everything with Bayes, but people are doing a reasonable job. So while Terry asks his question, put your hand up so that you can get Terry, the other Terry. mic. So okay. yeah, wonderful talk. Um, you brought up optimal control theory as a framework, a model for explaining human motion. So Todorov's version requires that you specify the location where you want the reach to occur to uh, the yep. goal, and also the time at which you want that reach to reach the goal. Now, if you ask a human being, I want you to touch that in 1.1 seconds. Yeah. 
they're not very good at it because sure. we, we can't estimate time with that accuracy. So is this really the right optimal control framework? Sure. Okay, so the first thing to say is that, okay, so in the same way that people are complaining about Bayes because you've got to have a prior and it's arbitrary, you can always choose a prior to explain your data. It's also true in optimal feedback control. You can always choose a cost function to explain any data you see. So then it becomes what's a reasonable cost function. So that's another debate. And, and a problem with it is where the hell do cost functions come from? How do I decide when I want to get my keys on my pocket what the cost function is? That's a hard problem in itself. Coming back to the issue of, of time, you can still formulate, we, we have models where we don't fix the time. Um, you know, you can fix the accuracy and then the time comes out. So, you know, you can fix different components and then you can say, what's the fastest I can do it and still achieve it with 90% success? So I think the time issue is not such a problem. I think the hard problem is we're just pushing it back up to a cost function. And that's a hard thing to know how we generate a cost function for every movement. All right, we do have time for another question if there is one. Then let's thank okay. Daniel again and move, move on. <laughs>